All right, now we're gonna talk about in lake management, specifically increased loss. Not worrying about the growth of the algae, just how do I get rid of them? You know, how do I get less algae out there? Uh, mechanically, you can harvest them. You can't harvest a planktonic bloom, but you can harvest a mat. Uh, it's not terribly efficient. They have built some harvesters, Aquarius out of uh, Wisconsin is harvesters that have real fine mesh, almost like a, a grocery store conveyor belt that will pull up mats and dump them in a hopper. The Chicago Botanical Garden uses them because it's a botanical garden. It's gonna be fertilizer. It's gonna be high nutrients in the water. They get these mats popping up and they can go around and clean them up. Um, you can certainly do that. It's, it's not a bad idea. You'll get some of the phosphorus removed with the mats, but you can pretty much expect you're gonna be doing it forever. It's, it's not like you do it a few years and you're done. Um, there's something now, APOD technology, it's been developed here in Massachusetts. Jonathan Higgins has a number of technologies like this where you can actually collect the algae. Now, I don't know that you're gonna do this in a big lake and I don't know that people would necessarily like this being in their little pond, but the point is if you're having problems with blooms, you could collect it and get it out that way. It sort of concentrates it and gives you ability to remove it. There's some portable dissolved air flotation technology being demonstrated now on a barge where you can ride around in the lake and pull it up. I even read something recently about electro, electrodes being put in the water that somehow drew the algae in, particularly cyanobacteria, and captured them that way and destroyed them. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with this. They tend to be smaller scale applications. You know, I, I can't envision this on a thousand acre lake. Um, not that it couldn't be done, but it, it doesn't strike me as particularly applicable. But where you've got smaller ponds and lakes, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with any of this. They're certainly permittable. Um, and they could help with your problem. The catch is most of these are maintenance techniques. They're not going to get rid of the true source of the problem, which is the nutrients, but it is a way to increase the loss. Uh, flushing is another one. You're really just putting enough water in to send everything downstream. Be careful not to confuse that with dilution. I'll talk about that under the growth control. They get thrown in together a lot because it's hard to separate the influence. Obviously, if you're putting in clean water to dilute, you're also increasing flushing. Uh, but the catch with flushing is you need to replace that water about every three weeks, preferably faster if it's more fertile, uh, because that's all it takes for an algal bloom to develop. And I've already discussed the algae blooms that start at the bottom and pop up. They may still happen even though you've been flushing it out. But if you can keep the water moving through the system, uh, you can actually get rid of a lot of algae. Of course, it's going downstream and that may be another issue. Um, the dilution, aspect and the flushing aspect tend to go hand in hand. Uh, people that do these projects think that the dilution is actually more important than flushing because oftentimes you can't get to at least every three weeks. That's replacing the entire volume of target water and that's challenging, but you can do it. Uh, I point out the uh, fire hydrant at the top. You know, if you're really trying to flush, that would be a way to do it in a small pond. The catch is under the Anti-Corrosion Act provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act, most of our public drinking water supplies have extra phosphate put in them to minimize corrosion of the distribution pipes. So as a result, if you use that, you're actually going to get more phosphorus in your lake than before you started. Um, again, if you flush and keep the water moving, you'll probably be okay, but you're actually adding more phosphorus because that's even true with dilution unless it's distilled water with no phosphorus in it. You're adding more phosphorus. You're just diluting the concentration. Hexonication. Um, this is another one that is more recent than a lot of other things. Basically, you're disrupting the cells with sound waves. It may break the cell up or it may just dissociate the plasma from the cell wall and make the interchange from the external to the internal cell problematic. Um, it's not going to get rid of the nutrients. It's not going to control growth per se, but it'll kill the algae and it'll keep them from growing by continuously killing them off. Uh, Perfectly workable solution. People use this in the lab uh, to break up al algal cells to get counts or biomass measurements. Uh, they use it in drinking water four bays and systems to keep stuff from growing on the walls of the, the four bay or, or various treatment tanks. Um, you know, on the bottom left, I'm showing sort of the before and after. You don't ever want that. You don't want to let it get like the left hand picture and then zap it to look like the right hand because now you put all the organic matter and nutrients back in the water column. But where you've got a place where you can't control the nutrients, I think right away of the waterfowl pond at a zoo. 
a golf course pond, places that are just not going to be nutrient free, this is a maintenance activity that can work. Uh, it's particularly good at controlling cyanobacteria. Some of the diatoms and greens tend to be more resistant and that's okay. A lot of times you're targeting the blue greens. So it's, it's a reasonable way to go. There is a dairy to algal susceptibility. I actually looked at algae samples for one of the companies that does this. I don't work for them. I'm an independent party. They send me, I get samples sent from people. I look at them and say what's in it so somebody can decide is this likely to work. It does not work on everything. There is one fundamental drawback and it's a line of sight technique, um, you know, almost like shining a flashlight on it. It's not that the sound waves, you know, can't go somewhat around a corner, but you can't make a right angle bend and expect it's gonna have the same effect. So you've got to have a direct line on it. And if you're successful, you can expect that rooted plants may grow in the shallow water, which will then block the signal. So you've got multiple things to do. It's what I call aquatic whack-a-mole. And a lot of techniques suffer from that. But in terms of actually being able to use this and control algae in a high nutrient situation, it can work for certain types of algae. You have to know what you've got. Um, algicides. Dirty word to a lot of people, hey, throwing toxins and poisons in my lake. Well, it's true. It's particularly toxic to the algae. Uh, but you know, if you're a water supplier, you have to ask the question, do I want a little copper or peroxide in my system or do I want to have cyanobacteria producing toxins that I have to deal with in my drinking water supply? Um, you know, it, it's a trade-off. It's not a yes or no answer. Um, there's relatively few active ingredients available. There are some herbicides, you know, endothol, flumeoxazin that get used and actually are pretty effective on certain types of filamentous algae. Uh, but mostly it's copper uh, or peroxides. And peroxides are way more recent. Interestingly enough, in Massachusetts, the law actually states that a drinking water supplier can apply copper without permit. But because the law is old, it doesn't say they can use peroxide, which is environmentally more friendly. We got a little law issue there. Um, but copper is not as bad as it often gets made out to be. There have been several studies of lakes that have had copper treatments for decades, and they've never found a negative impact, at least in the long run. You, if you overload it, you could certainly kill things initially. Uh, some zooplankton will be sensitive, even at the levels normally applied. Uh, the label allows you, in most cases, to treat up to half the lakes. So there's a limit right there at up to a milligram per liter of copper. The reality is in New England, we hardly ever do more than 0.1 milligram per liter and very little other than sensitive algae are killed by that. So have to be a little careful understanding what gets done worldwide or nationwide versus what gets done in your locality. If you're in New England, you don't use a lot of copper. It's, it's a very low dose and it's very effective. Um, peroxides on the other hand, which are more recent, really high oxidants, they will oxidize the cell wall. Uh, they're very effective on cyanobacteria as well, less so on greens and diatoms. So you can kind of what they call prune the bloom, uh, cut into the, the cyanobacteria before they become dominant. And that's what leads to the critical thing about algicides. This is not something that you do once you have the problem. It's not, hey, my lake is green, let's throw some algicide in there. You have to track the algae and treat at the right time. The object being you are treating before or the problem algae become too abundant, you're getting them on their exponential growth phase and cutting them off at the pass. So I'll show you an example if you've done this, but you know, basically copper things that I've thrown up here, I don't need to reread it to you. Uh, same thing about peroxide. They're similar in many regards, but they do have different modes of, of action. Copper tends to be less expensive. Peroxide, if done well, may last longer. It may be a relatively even trade-off. Um, I'm not excited about the potential impacts of copper on fish and zooplankton, but the reality is I can't tell you I've ever seen it become a real problem. I am not aware of a single copper treatment that's caused a fish kill in my entire career. I'm sure it happened in the past and maybe somewhere, but I've, I've not seen it. Peroxide, just not an issue. And peroxide, because it's oxidizing, might also oxidize some of the uh, toxins. So there's a benefit there. But again, it is more expensive. Um, there's lots of tricks you can use, like getting it on the bottom so that you kill those algae at the bottom before they ever float up. Uh, the timing is really important. Okay, here's an example from a, a lake near, not too far from me, actually. They've worked on for years. Um, they were building up a war chest to do an aluminum treatment, phosphorus inactivation, which I'll come to later. 
In the meantime, we tracked the algae pretty closely and they used copper treatments that you see in the bottom graph. So you can see whenever the concentration crossed 3000 micrograms per liter. And again, there's no magic number for a bloom. Under a thousand is pretty good. That's under a milligram per liter, a thousand micrograms per liter. Over 3000 gets to be an issue in many cases. And certainly when you get up to five or 10,000, that's a serious bloom. Uh, once they broke over 3000, they would do a treatment. Of course, if that worked really well in 2017, it knocked it down and they stayed under for the rest of the year. 2018, they hadn't hit 3000 yet, but they had a fair amount of blue green showing up. They waited a little while, like three weeks, and all of a sudden they had a bloom before they treated. Well, once you treat when you have a bloom, again, you can only treat half the lake. That's the label restriction. You don't do the whole thing at once. So you're never getting rid of all of it. And in fact, things regrouped and they got another bloom a couple months, well, a month later, not even a month. Um, and they had to treat again, second time. The next year, we're a little more careful. We hit it as soon as the blue green started showing up, dropped it out, did okay. And then the next year we did the aluminum treatment. They haven't had a problem since. Um, I'm not suggesting that copper is a valid alternative to phosphorus inactivation. Phosphorus inactivation is growth control. This is loss control. If you have the problem, you have to deal with it, but you're better off dealing with it before it becomes a severe problem. Okay, barley straw. This basically the decomposition of barley straw becomes, uh, creates uh, compounds that act as an algaecide. Uh, they inhibit a lot of algae, particularly cyanobacteria. That Steve McComas from out in Minnesota there, I think he had the best statement on this. It works sometimes, I'm not sure why. Well, I think we do understand now that they're creating these compounds that act as algal inhibitors. The catch is you're also putting a lot of organic matter in, which is going to create an oxygen sag potentially, the deficit at the bottom, which now may actually encourage more phosphorus to be released, which will give you more algae. The real issue though, is that this is not a registered algicide. So no professional can come in and do this for you legally because it doesn't have a label. It doesn't have uh, controls. You can do a do-it-yourself project on this, but I think most competent applicators will shy away from this because they're not really using a licensed product. Viral controls. This was a hot topic in the 70s. It made a resurgent in the early 2000s. It really hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, it makes sense theoretically. I mean, you put in some kind of virus that kills blue greens and drops them out. The problem is just like you see in the images there, if you can go from the untreated on the left to the treated on the right, are you gonna be happy? Your lake is still green. You've still got those algae in there. It's better than it was before, way better, but it's still a problem. Likewise, on the bottom with the, the, the plates, you know, it kills a lot of it, but not all of it. That's the pile problem with biological controls to begin with. They're never as reliable as chemical or physical means. It doesn't mean they're not useful, uh, just that you can't count on the results quite the same way. Okay, biomanipulation, I love this stuff. This is actually, it's not my PhD thesis, but it's what I did to support myself while I was doing my PhD as I looked at biomanipulating lakes where we adjusted the fish community to encourage more large-bodied zooplankton that would then eat more algae. And it worked. Now, the, the Scandinavian and European literature suggests that if you have more than 80 parts per billion of phosphorus, this won't work. It'll overwhelm it. I think the answer is actually less than that. Once you get over 30 or 40 micrograms per liter, I'm not sure it works. But if you can get down to 20, 30 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, it's still enough to cause a bloom. Those algae will eat a lot of the algae that are there and you can actually get a lot more clear water than you would have otherwise. So your fish structure matters. There's some cool experiments. Um, oh, Harris and Wilhelm did this work uh, out in some Wyoming reservoirs where they put mesocosms in and they actually put more nitrogen in the water to shift things and they wound up uh, getting less blue greens and then the zooplankton ate the algae that were there and they got clear water, pretty cool. But of course you take away the, the enclosure that makes the mesocosm. Now you got fish that are gonna eat those zooplankton and it's harder to manage. Biological things, again, not as reliable. They work, they have a clear theory behind them, but getting it to do what you want, when you want all the time, not so easy. Uh, one thing in particular that I've gotten <laughs> unintentionally embroiled in this in Maine is the alewife issue. They're trying to restore alewife runs to a lot of lakes where they've been blocked by dams. And that's the moral high ground. I mean, if I was dictator, I would absolutely say we have to do this. 
those things were there. We prevented it. They're part of a much bigger ecosystem that we should support. However, if you live on that lake and you've spent a million dollars in the last decade to clean up your phosphorus act and you now have nice clear water, Why there, will be virtually, an echo? there will be virtually no daphnia in those lakes. I mean, look at the graph. The blue dots are uh, alewife lakes. There's no daphnia there. So there's nothing much to eat the, the, the algae that are produced and your lake is going to have the most algae it can for whatever level of fertility you're at. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have alewife. What it means is you really got to control the phosphorus in those situations because you don't have the biological buffering capacity that you might have otherwise. So again, this is the problem with biological manipulations. Um, it's hard to control it and there's a lot of things that get in the way. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we can talk about discussion of increased loss of algae as a management approach. Yeah, you have a bunch of questions now. <laughs> you can decide whether or not those they've been answered but appropriately in, in other conversations after they were initially asked. But um, So first one from Dennis Greger, does increasing temperature of water bodies further offset benefits of watershed management with respect to the control of algae? It does. Uh, you know, the climate change issue is such that algal ecology, and this is part of our algal ecology lecture that we cover here, uh, you can almost predict what algae you're going to have based on the temperature of the water. It's because different algal groups have different food storage mechanisms, and the food is best metabolized at different temperatures. So diatoms and goldens like cold water. They store oils. Greens store starch. They like intermediate temperatures. Cyanobacteria store uh, sugar-like compounds and prefer warmer waters. So I'm not sure that watershed management is necessarily offset by temperature, but in terms of you can manage the watershed, but if you have warmer water, you'll have a faster growth rate. You'll have a higher oxygen demand at the bottom because the temperature fuels bacterial decomposition. You'll have more phosphorus release and the warmer water favors cyanobacteria. So functionally, the answer is yes, but it's a lot more complicated than just a yes. Mm -hmm. Great. And then we'll ask watershed management in the context of legacy phosphorus and long-term inputs, can you discuss the necessary time scales to reduce inputs using best management practices? If I'm understanding it correctly is can you get rid of your internal load by managing the watershed? The answer is no. Um, you will get improvement. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, selective withdrawal where they've stopped the watershed inputs to a large degree and then kept flushing the lake out to see how long it would take to improve. And the answer is 20 to 30 years. So there's your time frame. And they never got to the desirable level they wanted, never reached 20 micrograms per liter. So it, you still have to deal with the internal load. Again, if you don't deal with the external load, you still have leaks in your boat, it's still gonna fill up with water. Um, but the time scale for a lake to recover on its own, if it does it all, it's long. And this is this next question from Gina is something I've often wondered. It says, for harvesting methods for cyanobacteria blooms, do you know if those, the folks doing that are using, sorry, using those methods are monitoring for cyanotoxin release during harvest and in the con concentrated materials and how are the collected materials being disposed? Ah, well, Yes, you're, you're going to concentrate the algae. So obviously you're concentrating whatever toxins are present. First, major caveat, if you see a lot of algae or even a lot of cyanobacteria, it does not mean you have a lot of toxin. Visually seeing a bunch of algae does not equate to having toxin. You have to make that measurement. No measure of algae other than direct toxin testing will tell you if you have toxin. Obviously, if you have a lot of algae, the risk is higher, uh, but it's not a guarantee, but if the toxin's present and you concentrate those algae, yeah, there's more of it there. How they dispose of it, that's a real good question. I guess I wonder too. Um, I think a lot of time it goes to compost piles or it gets spread on the ground somewhere. And those toxins do degrade pretty rapidly. You know, uh, John Rogers at Clemson's had grad students work on this. He's always concerned about like restricting people from treating algae when the density gets too high. A lot of States have regulations about, oh, you know, 70,000 cells per milliliter you can't treat because they don't want to release the toxins in the environment. His point is that 
those are going to get decayed in 24 to 72 hours. Why would you not get rid of it instead of keep letting stuff grow and produce more toxins? And it's a fair point. So I guess if you're saying, what do we do with this? Because it's possibly toxic. It's a good question. and I don't have an answer. You're saying, let's not do anything because we might not be able to get rid of it. Well, that, that's debatable. Yeah. Um, and Dave Neal said, how successful is sonication for lake-wide applications, say 10 acres or more? Um, I have seen it used in bigger systems. Uh, there's a reservoir I work with in Virginia that has about, about a 10 acre four bay where they pull in the water from uh, a reservoir that's got a tremendously developed watershed. What, what they do in other states or out in New England with water supplies is amazing to me. Uh, but that they have a couple big sonication units that are you know three three day or 360 degree. And although they don't have no algae, they do tend to have less cyanobacteria and they've used a lot less copper in recent years as a result of this. So it, it can work. It's just how big an area you're gonna do. You've either got to run electricity or have them solar powered. And now all of a sudden you've got a forest of them out there. You know, the people that make them may be able to give you an idea of how many acres can be treated per unit. I can only tell you from experience, I have one project, small one acre pond, amoeboid shape designed by a landscape architect. You know, they do everything but put them on a slope. Uh, and it took five units to cover effectively that one acre of area. So, you know, I just don't see putting out hundreds and hundreds of these things in a bigger lake, but where you've got an intake, a swim area, some spot where you want to make sure you're killing off the algae, it could certainly work. Okay. Are there any concerns with peroxides and fish? Not that I'm aware of. Um, obviously, you have a label that restricts how much you can put in. The amount you can put in, to the best of my knowledge, has never caused any toxicity with fish. I could see, however, if you were treating the bottom, putting it in pellets that would drop down and then dissolve at the bottom to kill off algae growing there. Suppose there's also fish eggs there. I would think that it would zap those fish eggs pretty good because uh, mm -hmm. they're a membrane just like anything else. So th there is no free lunch. There's nothing that's a perfect solution. It's all trade-offs. Of course, the flip side is there's not a whole lot spawning at the time you tend to have cyanobacteria blooms. So there, there's temporal and spatial considerations to be thrown in. Mm -hmm. And a very similar question, is copper toxic to mollusks? Uh, yes, at a high enough concentration. Uh, we were looking at some way to deal with zebra mussels in the only lake in Massachusetts that has them. And a person put together a whole review of things and concluded that in order to kill the zebra mussels, we would probably also be killing an endangered snail in the lake. And that put an end to that one. Uh, I guess if the zebra mussels eliminate the, the, the endangered snail, then we can kill the zebra mussels. But until they've done that, we can't touch them with, with a compound that could also hurt the snail. So yes, uh, again, there's no trade, there's no free lunch. There's a trade off in everything. I will say that the copper being used for zebra mussels these days is being used at a low dose repetitively at a point where it has not been killing a lot of other things. Some mortality, probably, but wiping other things out that's not been the experience so far. So again, what are you willing to trade? When it comes to an endangered species, often the answer is none. So you suck. Yeah, and, and this, I guess this is a kind of a question which could be very nuanced. Um, <laughs> do zooplankton graze cyanobacteria? I was under the impression that zooplankton would discriminate against cyanobacteria or maybe graze things other than cyanobacteria. Well, zooplankton generally do a very poor job eating cyanobacteria. You're talking about plecoplankton or whatever, they can get them. But again, at the pictures I showed you where uh, they're big globs, like eight, eight foot plate of spaghetti and you have no utensils, the zooplankton aren't able to graze them. That's the ecological advantage of forming a colony at the bottom than getting gas pockets in the cells and floating up. You're already too big to eat. You're as big as the zooplankton that would like to eat you. Also, but I don't think the toxins in zooplankton are a big effect on, I'm sorry, toxins in cyanobacteria are a big effect on zooplankton, but uh, they are poor nutritional value in many regards. What zooplankton like to eat, 
is not a very good match for cyanobacteria. So uh, unfortunately, while I think that a lot of things lead to more cyanobacteria, the idea of getting zooplankton to graze them down doesn't work out real well. That's where, for example, the, the issue with alewife or any other dense planktivores eating all your zooplankton, that's not going to cause a cyanobacteria bloom by itself because the cyanobacteria weren't going to be able to eat those, I'm sorry, the zooplankton weren't going to be able to eat those cyanobacteria in the first place. It's other nutrient issues that create the cyanobacteria. It just takes away whatever biological buffering capacity you might have. All right, we have three more. What are your thoughts on the use of biochar to reduce phosphorus? Biocides? Biochar, C-H-A-R. Oh, biochar. Now, that's a watershed technique. That's getting the water to pass through a medium. So it's an active treatment. Um, it's biochar. There's uh, well, a utro something that Cipro has just come out with. There's a lot of stuff out there. and We're getting better and better at it. Um, if you can get the water, to pass through the medium, it works pretty well. The problem is that that stormwater you most want to treat has often got a lot of sediment in, which may now clog up what you're trying to go through, or the water just flows too fast and it goes right over top of it and goes by it. So if you're trying to treat background flows, I think it works great, but background flows don't have most of the phosphorus. So I think it has great potential. We're not where we need to be yet with it, I will say that CPRO, the talk been given by a couple of their reps at recent conferences about all the work they've put into testing different things and trying to see what they could get to work. And I had a conversation recently with a rep from a company that makes chitosan, which is, I guess, made from shells and is calcium based, but also is really good at inactivating phosphorus in the right circumstances. All these things have merit. I think they're all valuable. Unfortunately, physically getting them to work when you have high flows is still a challenge. If you could do something in a detention area where you make sure it's all contacted before it leaves, I think that has a lot greater possibility than just throwing them in a stream. Okay, as temperatures rise faster in shallow coves, does depth management via dredging help? Or not if cyanobacteria are generated from deep areas or the thermocline? Well, I'm, I'm gonna talk about dredging coming up, but yeah, it, okay. if you have a shallow cove and you've got a lot of muck sitting there because the slope is not that great, you're gonna have an option demand and the potential for phosphorus to be available for algal uptake right there. In the really shallow areas where the groundwater is coming in, you know, groundwater is hot, inflow is highest at the edge of the lake and then drops off as you go deeper and I don't have time to run through the details. Yes, you could have a spring somewhere that contradicts that, but for the most part, it's a shallow water phenomenon usually has high nitrogen, and that's why you get the green algal mats around the edge. The blue-greens tend to be out further where there's not as much nitrogen, particularly as nitrate, and where the phosphorus levels are high in that sediment and it's readily available. The water above it may be oxygenated, but that doesn't keep them from getting at the phosphorus that's right at the surface of the sediment. We will discuss that in greater detail later. Okay, two more. If a lake has algae type one in year one, how likely is it to have algae type one in year two? In other words, will you always get a toxic or non-toxic cyanobacteria in the same lake? Okay. Over the, yeah, the type of algae present from year one to year two to year three does tend to be the same. The reason for that is that almost all the algae produce a resting stage. Um, in cyanobacteria, it's an acne or, uh, oh gosh, forgot what the term for the... Uh, the long thin winds in oscillatoria are, but they basically drop these things to the bottom and then those hatch, germinate and come back the next year. So if you had new stuff coming in all the time, if you're downstream from some other lake and different things come down at different times, you might get differences. But for the most part, you do expect to see the same algae over and over and over. I have a lake that we did phosphorus and activation on in 1995. It lost its delichospermum species for 17 years. And then the exact same species came back later, you know, when the treatment wore off. It, it is amazing because you have those resting stages down there. Now, if you do dredging and remove the sediment with those resting stages, now you're likely to get something different. Okay. And somebody put, Gina put in the uh, chat, the name you were looking for. So um, when, and last one, when alewife migrate back to the sea, don't they take their nutrients with them? 
Ah, that is a great into question. The that person may have been listening to the propaganda put out by the pro railway forces. Uh, <laughs> if you know, it, it's again, if you made me dictator, I would make all dams have fishways or take them out so the fish could get back where they are. But if I was dictator, I could also decree that we would clean up our act with regard to phosphorus and we'd manage our lakes well. Um, I'm not dictator, it's not gonna happen. Uh, when the alewife migrate back out, those that have grown in the system and have phosphorus in them will take that phosphorus with them. Many of the adults die and remain in the system where they laid their eggs. Many of the juveniles also die either by getting eaten by fish who excrete nutrients or uh, because of starvation, you know, really, really good uh, crop of alewife in a year, they're gonna be starving. They're gonna wanna get out of that lake as soon as possible because there's nothing to eat. In fact, they start eating the detritus at the bottom because there's no zooplankton left. And I've looked at this in a number of lakes. Other people have studied it. What I've done is nothing new. I've just looked at it from a different angle. I was actually trying to figure out why some phosphorus and activation treatments do better than others. And the answer was partly because of the fish community and what it means for the zooplankton. Well, if you do the models, and there are decent models out there, the conditions under which more nutrients leave the lake that have come into the lake with alewife is a special case and a rare one. More often, it's closer to net zero, and sometimes there's more going in. If you think about it evolutionarily, salmon come up and they die and they fertilize the streams where they lay their eggs. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for alewife to come in though and turn a lake eutrophic because that would be a problem with oxygen and everything else for their young. Neither does it make any sense that alewife would come in and make a lake oligotrophic so that their juveniles had nothing to eat. It makes no ecological sense for alewife to have a major influence on the nutrient budget of the lake. And I'll go to my death swearing to that, but I know both sides of this issue want you to believe that either way more nutrients are brought in or way more nutrients are brought out. Neither of those has a shred of actual evidence behind it. Well, and I think the interesting thing is maybe not even, is that, you're right. I was interested to see how you would answer that question. But also that because I've seen people say, well, there's not really any effect of having the ill wife because they've always been there and they probably just wind up taking more nutrients out that they bring. So whether or not they're there, there's no effect at all on the lakes. Well, it, it has a huge effect on the zooplankton community. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. If you've got a lake with smelt in it, alewife will decimate them because they'll have nothing to eat. And in fact, in Maine, there's at least an unwritten agreement, if not actually written, that they won't put alewife back into lakes with a good smelt population. Um, you know, we don't think about it too much down here uh, in Massachusetts because we have got a portion of coast and if the alewife can run, they run. Uh, but again, it, it, there's definitely an impact. The point is there was an impact or whatever impacts there were existed historically and we changed that. Should we let it go back the way it was? I, I think it makes perfect sense. The catch is, you think about this beyond the science, this is a sociological issue. If I live on a lake and we've spent a lot of money to clean that lake up, and now by letting the alewife back in, you're gonna decrease the quality of the lake, you're gonna decrease my property value, you're gonna decrease the tax base, now it affects schools, the police department, maybe the hospital. That's a real economic impact. And there's real studies showing that that's real. Is it a big enough impact to offset the overall value of alewife and the whole ecosystem? I doubt it. But if I'm a person living on that lake, I got something to say about it. And I think that you, know, you have to consider that. It has to be part of the equation. And the people that want so badly to get alewife back in all the lakes where they used to be, want to gloss over that. They don't want to talk about that. And that's not right. That's not how we do lake management. And the longer you talk, more questions appear, but this will be the last question before you go on to the next session, uh, our section. Does invasive weed herbicides or harvesting free up phosphorus that feeds algal blooms? Is it, do, does harvesting free up phosphorus, you're saying? I think maybe the idea is that if you don't have those items, those organisms continuing to grow in the lake, then the phosphorus is more available to bloom. Oh, well, maybe. I think that's generally what's... not. Uh, very few rooted plants get their nutrition out of the water column. They're getting it from the sediment. So they may be leaky. I'll actually talk about plants as well in a little bit. So why don't we save that for now? But generally speaking, removing the plants, you may switch the system over that alternative stable states towards being more dominated by algae. 
but it's not really affecting the nutrient budget of the lake. 